Hi, I'm Phil. And I'm Shane. And this is episode 26 of My Tech Opinion. And in this episode, we'll be talking about data backups or backing up your data. So let's get started now. Welcome to My Tech Opinion, episode 26. My name is Phil Edwards and I'm in Melbourne and I'm joined by my regular co-host in Perth, Shane Johnson. G'day, Shane. Hey, Phil. How are you? Good, good. Uh, before we get into the formalities, I just want to remind everyone that My Tech Opinion is brought to you by Aussie Tech Heads Web Hosting. For great hosting plans and support, visit athwebhosting.com.au. For the listeners uh, and viewers joining us for the first time, My Tech Opinion is a program that has a deeper look at a feature topic each and every episode. It might always just be the two of us. Where possible, we'll also have guests join us and lend their expertise and knowledge to help us unpack our feature topic. I had a weird spacing in my sentence there. Uh, that said, our feature topic this episode, we'll be looking at backups and what's, what some of your options are, whether it's local, network, cloud, whatever it goes. So we'll be talking about that today. So anyway, Shane, uh, I'm back. You had uh, Daniel Olivares in the chair for episode number 25. Thanks to Daniel for doing that. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And uh, you had a good discussion on eSports. Um, so uh, uh, it was good. Uh, I'm, I'm probably a better person to have on than I was for that particular topic. Yeah, no, it was good. Um, yeah, obviously, the... I wasn't. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I knew what his routine was in um, gigs interrupted and all that kind of stuff. So, but given that we kind of just did it on the run and all that kind of stuff, it was a good topic and good, good it's recording, good. good episode. Excellent. Um, what else uh, have we talked about? Um, your now we're recording this uh, the weekend of the AFL preliminary finals. It'll probably come out after maybe around the time the grand final goes, uh, is happening. But uh, you are coming to Melbourne uh, for the grand final, as we can tell by your illustrious background there, Shane. Yeah, you, you noticed, did you? <laughs> really? Is it hard not to notice? Yeah. No, it was, um, it was a good game because obviously it was on today and um, I know it was coming anyway and I was you know, going to go yeah. to the game anyway. But now that it's got a little bit more importance because you know, the team that I follow is in there. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Excellent. Um, yeah, pretty commanding performance from the Eagles. Not that this is a sports show. So uh, it'll be interesting to see the result of the grand final next Saturday in Melbourne time. Yes. And if you're watching this after the grand final, this has got really old. So we apologise. So it could be bad luck, Shane, for wearing West Coast Eagles jumper uh, uh, clothing. On the other side of it, it could be congratulations for wearing West Coast Eagles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm either going to look like an Nostradamus or I'm going to look like an idiot one of the two. <laughs> That's all right. Um, the other side of it is is that I was at a grand final a few years ago and I think it was a, a Frio supporter on the year that Frio didn't make it, but he turned up and still wore his Frio gear. <laughs> Did it get I'm like... If you're going to go to the football and your team's not playing, just wear normal clothes. Yeah, go neutral. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. The only thing is, is I've only got like a t-shirt, like a polo shirt. So I'm going to try and maybe do some shopping and get a cap or scarf or something tomorrow. Yes. Well, um, AFL stores. You've got AFL stores over there, I think. Yeah. But I have a horrible and feeling that would, they're going to you know, crank up the prices <laughs> now that the Eagles are in it. Yeah. And the other thing is, is head down to where the Eagles, I'm sure that they're going to have to have a... The, their shop open to you know over the weekend or something before you head away. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? So yes, uh, what else has been happening? Uh, you've got in the show notes there. Um, they've announced some stuff on the latest in smart TVs and uh, LG because LG are rolling out Google Assistant compatibility across um, all of their 2018 smart TVs. Yeah, have we told people why you weren't here last week, the last episode? Um, no, 
Oh, I will. You made a note in the show notes last week that it was because my team lost in the football. Yeah, which was not not the case, even though I have auto play videos going. Um, no, I was in Queensland for a family function. Oh, so. okay. Good. Um, yes, I uh, had had a weekend uh, on the Goldie, as they say. That's where I'm heading after Melbourne. There you go. Um, so yes, um, uh, yeah. So the smart, uh, the, the Google assistants are, are going across multiple TVs. Do you like the idea? Because I don't think much of them, and it's not because of the Google assistant thing. It's the smart TVs are great for some people, but I don't. It's not my cup of tea. Yeah. The issue that you might have is that if it's embedded in the smart TV, you're reliant on the smart TV manufacturer to keep it up to date. Whereas yep. if it's in a Google appliance attached to the smart TV, then you know, there's a better chance of Google keeping it up to date. So I'm just trying to find out because I don't... Are the LGs now Android TV? Not 100% sure. So I have a I have a Sony um, Bravia which is has got Android it's powered by Android TV, which is not too bad, but it's a bit all over the shop to be honest, and I find it a bit hard to um, to uh, configure. But that said, I'm also an Apple nutbag, as yeah. we all know, yeah. um, and I use the Apple TV, which it just works for me. So we rarely use the smart TV capability. Within the um, within the the Android TV, funnily enough, um, if I was an Android uh, user, then that would change a bit because um, of casting to the screen and, and all that sort of stuff. So it, yeah, it doesn't um, it doesn't really bother me. I find talking to your television a really strange thing anyway. So the the talking to the Google Assistant doesn't really interest me too much. I remember hearing something on a podcast only in the last couple of weeks along the lines of um, the reason why that Skype never took off in TVs is because it never had the microphones to pick up the commands across the voice above the you know, the sound of the TV or whatever else was going on. Yep. Do we think that this is going to have the same problem? Um, I think that... Uh, yeah, but see, the thing is, like, a, a lot of the remotes now, I know that I've got a remote for my Sony TV that I don't even use, and there's also a remote for, well, I, I have, because I use a Harmony remote. Oh, yeah. Um, to one device to control them all. And, but my Apple TV remote has a microphone in the remote. Yep. So rather than using infrared, it uses Bluetooth, and you can talk into the remote for that. I think the other thing is people... This, in terms of Skype TVs, because a, a few TVs came out before the real smart TV revolution thing, that you could get cameras to put on your TV so you could video call with people and all that sort of thing. The problem is I think people are freaked out by webcams sitting on front of their TV pointing at them on the couch. Yeah. At least with a computer, you're sitting in front of a computer, so you're interacting with that particular device, whereas having a... You know, people are at sort of their, um, uh, you know, most relaxed when they're in front of the TV. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and, of course, then there was discussions about how some TV, smart TVs were quite vulnerable as well. Oh, excuse me. Uh, vulnerable to, uh, to hacking and things like that. So I think that that's where people had a bit of an issue, but I think that there's certain apps. I think that there's some app providers that are smart about it, you know, and, and looking at the article that we've got here, you know, things like weather apps and, and that sort of thing are quite helpful built in games and things like obviously Netflix and, and what have you as well. Um, you know, you'll notice a lot of TVs now have a Netflix button and a YouTube button. Yep. And, you know, that's that the Netflix actually, almost demands that as opposed to um, requesting it. So, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. So, but but I still think that, you know, people, uh, I would prefer a, a TV to be a monitor for all intensive purposes um, with a digital tuner in it, but um, where you have, um, 
the um, where you use third party boxes to, to do things like whether it be a Chromecast, whether it be an Apple TV, um, a Fire TV, that sort of thing. So, you know, they're always good devices as well. Um, and the other thing that they tend to do in America, which they don't do here with Foxtel, which annoys me, yeah. is in America you can get well, some TVs you can buy have expansion cards at the back of them. So you can actually buy, they've got the satellite tuner or whatever tuner in, in the back of the TV already. Yep. And you hook up your wall cable into the TV and you just put in the smart card for your particular service. Yep. So it automatically connects up. Here you've got to have a Foxtel box. Yep. You've got to have it all cabled in. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And that's where it's going to be. Um, uh, that's where it's going to be. That's where I think it's a bit painful. And the cost of it's ridiculous too. So Yeah. But anyway, so, but yeah, look, it'll be interesting to see how they go along there. They're, they're trying to find different ways to differentiate on TV. Um, the, the thing is, is that I think TV sales, to be honest, there's, there's LG are, are pretty good with their OLEDs um, and they've led the way on the OLEDs. OLEDs, Sony and Samsung are getting into that market. But we, we went through a period over the past 10 years where everyone upgraded their TVs. Yep. So, you know, when I um, first moved out of, of um, in, into this particular house with my wife, we had a couple of CRTs um, with set-top boxes and we, pre we moved to a, you know, a, a big TV in the lounge room and then we progressively updated the rest of the house. Um, so now that we've got all LCDs, but I've got no reason to upgrade in the, anytime soon. Yep. Um, and I will, when we've talked about on the show before, when I move into my new house, um, uh, in, you know, 12 months time, then I will be buying an additional TV there, but that's about as far as it goes. And I'm just hoping that the prices drop between now and then yeah, to get, uh, cause I want to get a big boy and I don't want to pay a lot for it. Speaking of new equipment, and this is not in the show notes, but I think I've noticed something on your wrist that's new. What's that? Is that an, is that the new Apple watch? That it is. So, uh, as we're recording this, the Apple Watch um, and the uh, iPhone XS and XS Max were released um, uh, the last day or so, to the public, that is. So, I did um, purchase a new um, uh, Apple Watch, um, which is not on the camera right now. Hang on, we'll see if I can get that. I've got one of the new. That's really poor. Yeah, it's yeah, it's gone off. But one of the new definitely looks like that the screen's bigger and it you know, rolls around that. Although when you do that, it looks like it's got a big black frame around it. Yeah, it, it does have a big black frame. It doesn't look it. It's smaller than it's a smaller than the other the old watch too, um, and uh, I'm still getting used to it. I've only had it for. 24 hours. Oh, shush. Uh, and then, yes, I have a, now I have a, an iPhone XS. I'm still getting used to that by the sound of it too. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I set Siri off before. So, um, yeah, so I uh, I spent a small fortune. So um, the Face ID, because um, this, uh, this is my first phone that has the Face ID. Oh, right. So, um because that, that came out, obviously, with the iPhone 10 last year, um, and I didn't upgrade then. I was waiting for my two-year cycle. And, um, yeah, so they... Uh, so, the because there's no home button, how you use it with your gestures are very different. Oh, okay. So I'm still getting used to that. Um, that said, as much as I'm an Apple fanboy, the... Uh, sport loop band that I do have um, is I hate already <laughs> right <laughs> because I've got to loosen it almost to the full level to get my wrist through and then you tighten it oh, yeah. and the thing I don't like about it is that it's got um, like a big the, loopy loop, thing. the loop bit there whereas the band that I had on my old watch Apple watch was just a flat band. So I'm getting a third-party band in and we'll go from there. Well, I thought that, the um, bands were compatible. They are, but I've got a different color watch. Uh -huh. 
So the my old watch, I decided to change color. My old watch was uh, space gray. My new watch is um, silver, aluminium silver. Oh, it's pretty close. So, yeah, but they don't match. Trust mm. me. Okay. I'm a stickler for these things. Then you were having a go at me about getting the picture right earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's all right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, look, they, they came out and, um, yeah, it's all good. Getting used to it. I, I'm still learning bits about it and um, uh, and I'm paying the price for changing to a new device as well, which I'm slowly migrating things across because I use a couple of different um, authenticator applications. So whether it be a Symantec one for work and there's a Google and an, a um, Microsoft one as well. And of course, the gets, it gets a new credential ID when you go to a new device. Uh, yep. So you then need to go back and re-establish the credential connection to everything. Yeah, reassign it, yep. So um, I'm going through that process because otherwise I won't be able to get into certain accounts when I really need to do it. <laughs> so yes. So um, yeah, that's an interesting exercise. Uh, the thing is, a lot of the improvements are with iOS 12 and um, there's some stuff that's probably been in Android for a while but uh, they haven't had an Apple and the big one is um, third-party password um, managers, yep. you can app, uh, in, they're integrated now at the keyboard level, whereas previously you'd have to flick between apps. Now it can recognize it using, in my case, one password and pop it in directly from where you are, which is just awesome. Yep. No, fair enough. So I'm very happy with that. Um, what else was there? In the, um, there was also an email from last episode that uh, we weren't able to answer. Do we actually mention it on the last episode or? We did, yeah. Danny, uh, Danny, Daniel and I um, gave it a bash and we think we pretty much did it, um, but we just wanted to kind of get your opinion because he's talking more about the technology that you use, the internet connection that you use rather than what we use. Sure. I'll read the email again. Hey guys, love the podcast. Great listening to you both each week. I'm preparing for NBN fiber to the curb and looking at modem options as the provider I'm planning to go with offer a crappy modem. I'm trying to determine, is it worth going the crappy modem and investing in good Wi-Fi router or getting a good modem router combo? I have a typical household, double story, 13 uh, plus devices connected via Wi-Fi, two kids on YouTube, PlayStation, Netflix. Perhaps you could do a show on the merits of both options. Um, we sort of have done that um, because of, uh, we talked about Wi-Fi and things like that in an earlier episode. I can't remember the number. I think it's about episode 10 or something like that. Yep. Um, but to answer the question is that um, the modem, there are two parts. There is the modem or the technically it's called the network connection device. Yep. You will be issued from your provider, but it is actually an MBM product. And that, as you've mentioned in the notes there, Shane, it's a reverse power feed. So what it gives you is a Ethernet connection. And then a lot of your providers will bundle in a router because the modem will be separate that you can use to, um, uh, to create your Wi-Fi and your you know, DHCP server and all those sort of things. Now, the, my answer, there's two parts to this answer, <laughs> which is quite painful. Um, the general rule is, yes, you can use whoever, you can use whatever router you want. You do not need to use the one the provider provides. Uh, and I would be going and buying a good one. I use, as we've talked about previously, I use Ubiquiti with ceiling mounted Wi-Fi hotspots um, so I can get a decent level of coverage throughout the whole property. But there's, and that ain't cheap yeah. and it may be overkill for a lot of people. Um, the other option, and or you can go and buy a night a Nicky Nighthawk, or you know whatever your flavour, a D Link product, whatever. So you can do that straight up. Now the other, where it becomes a bit more painful, is it also depends on what provider you're with. So the big one is going to be Telstra. Um, at TPG, not so much now, but I think they will be in the future. Um, but what Telstra provide you, they have their smart gateway that connects into the NBN network connection device, but 
what they do is they have a 4G backup built into it. So they have a SIM card, which is only limited to a set speed. I think it's 1,500 megabits per second or something like that. Um, it could be a bit faster. And then the other thing was um, if you intend on keeping your home phone, um, we then, which you would have to go onto a VoIP service, um, the Telstra, for example, require you to use their modem or their gateway for that VoIP service. Yep. You can't use a third-party thing. So in the case of Telstra, you might be better off just using their product, which I don't like their product, but that's just a me and a personal opinion. Um, uh, but depending on what you want to get out of it, you can do that. In the case of the Ubiquiti gear that I use, I haven't got this set up, but you can even... They've done a firmware update, whereas on the uh, USG, the um, the gateway device, it had a second LAN, a WAN port or a LAN port that was never ever utilized. And they've recently done it so that you can utilize it as a second connect network connection for failover and things like that. So you could effectively have it hooked up to a device that has a 4G modem attached and do some failover there. So there, there's options. It will depend on the provider that you go with. But if you're looking at a day-to-day provider such as TPG, Aussie Broadband, um, and what have you, then you can use whatever device you like without fear of anything else. And also, if you're going to the next level where you're just going naked, so you're not going to have a phone line attached, then you're fine. Yep. So I hope that answers the question. Should do. So short answer is, yes, you can do a dedicated router, but I would also look at what services you're having and talk to your provider about it as well. Yep. So there you go. Good stuff. Um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that we want to note about before we get into our feature topic. I was going to mention that, yes, the, the Apple um, devices came out, but we've already covered off on, covered off on that. Yep. And um, you can mention the football again if you want. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> can't mention the football. My team's not in it anymore, so that doesn't bother me. So. Uh, that's right. Oh, the one thing I will mention, yep. and I think I mentioned this on my other program, Geeks Interrupted. I was on a Virgin flight from Melbourne to the Gold Coast, and I was very excited to see that this flight is um, uh, has Wi-Fi. Um, that you could use, and and Virgin have two different tiers, uh, whereas uh, the Qantas planes that have Wi-Fi are just off you go. You can go and do what you like. The Virgin Wi-Fi uses a different service, um, and they have two tiers. They have a free tier, which will give you very basic um, stuff, so it'll be social media, some basic web browsing and things like that. But they had an option where you could pay, in my case, $12.99 for the flight, to get high-speed um, video streaming quality broadband. So I thought, well, the football's on. I can sit on the plane and watch the footy live. So I'll pay that $12.99. Good in theory. Wow. Well, well, that was a waste of $12.99. It was probably a bit more of a waste than that because at the time I spent trying to get it going, it was the worst internet connection. It was – I've had dial-up that's more regular than that. All right. It was awful. We got, I reckon, about 10 minutes of streaming audio was about all we could muster, yep. and then it died. Could I could get score updates from the football, could not get any video or anything. It was awful. So do you know whether that was because a whole bunch of passengers were trying to do the same thing, or it's just a crap service no matter what? I think that it just wasn't, it wasn't getting a decent stream through from the satellites. Okay. That's what I think it was. Um, I've read really good things on um, uh, on the Qantas service, which uses the MBN satellites. Um, people were getting an average about eight, seven to eight megabits per second um, on, with a plane full of tech journos who were on the plane to test the Wi-Fi. Yeah, but I bet you they bumped it up because of that. Yeah, true. But you know, look, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to fly a Qantas flight yet that has it. So hopefully one day I will and, and it'll all be nice. I've got two Qantas flights coming up. I'll let you know if that if, if I get it. Well, hopefully you do. Mm. So there you go. So there's all the, the stuff that we've caught up for in this week. 
Um, we might take a short break. And we'll come back with our feature topic. What do you reckon about that, Shane? Sounds good. This is My Tech Opinion. We'll be back in a moment. And welcome back to My Tech Opinion. It's now time for our feature topic. And this week we're talking about backups and uh, backing up your data and things like that. Um, we'll go through some stuff in a minute. So we'll, we'll talk about that and talk about some good backup practices. Um, uh, and we'll talk about some of the options in terms of off-site backup that you can do. It's sort of, it's never-ending um, uh, things that you can do with backups. It just depends on how um, anal that you want to be about um, protecting your data. Yep. And you, you've got to, you've got to do, um, this is my, I, this is my work hat going on here. Um my uh, advice is, particularly if you're looking at it from business, is I'd be doing a asset register of your information assets and grading them. So what are your crown jewels and then so on and so forth because if you lose a piece of data that is business critical and you need to restore it from backup, how critical is it to your business? Hmm. That makes sense. So if it's um, your intranet that mm, internet's not a good example. If it's the personal drives of staff that has their music on it that they play at their desk, that's not business critical. Right. But if it's you know the core database of your server that has all your client information and what have you, then of course it's going to rank higher. So how you treat that and how you back that up covers you know covers you off, and you've got to look at your risk assessments and uh, the list goes on. Yeah. So. The frequency of, in, so in terms of backups, there's um, effectively what you're doing is that you're copying your data at a set period of time uh, and then you're storing it in a way that you can retrieve it. Um, the Going back years and years and years ago, floppy disks would be the easy one that you would have used. And then as we progressed along, things like tape drives and what have you, so you're looking at the big reel tapes or even the, the cartridge-style tapes that would be able to get that back up on there and then you would move that off-site or you move that to another location so that you've got day-to-day -day backups. Um, but these days, of course, external hard drives and also cloud-based storage means that you can do automatic backups without even having to touch your machines and carry anything physically anywhere. Yep. So, what's your backup process, Shane? Pray. <laughs> no. Um. What I what I was doing, and I'm kind of still doing it, is I back stuff up to the NAS, and then I back that stuff up as kind of like snapshots. Yep. Onto the another part of the NAS, and then the final thing I do is the snapshot goes up onto the cloud. Cool. And do you do that daily, minute by minute? No, probably. I've got it scheduled. I should, actually, should have actually checked. I think it is. I think it's. No, I think it's weekly. Yep. Because the, the data, you know, don't me, so the data doesn't change much. That's fair enough. Um, we talked about it on our NAS episode uh, a few episodes ago, but. Um, one of the things that I do with my backup process, mine's not perfect by any means in the imagination, um, but uh, I have my NAS in RAID 5 config, um, or no, the Synology of equivalent of RAID 5 that you can scale up. Um, so that gives me coverage against the server, the, da the hard drives, but of course if the house burns down, that's useless. Um, and then there's key information that I do have going on to... Um, I use Google Drive, to be perfectly honest, yeah. and Dropbox, and my NAS is set that at 3 a.m. every morning it does a sync. So it syncs it up then so that – and because we do, for example, the video files for this particular program are on Google Drive, um, I do leave it at to that time because we might download a 10 gig file automatically, you know, very quickly. So yeah. we sort of – that's where we set, separate that out. Um, 
the, the, there's a couple of stages. So we're, we're talking about backing up locally. So one, if you're a Mac user and there is equivalent tools that you can use as a Windows user as well, but um, the uh, but Macs have Time Machine built in. So that does snapshots. And what it does is it does immediate snapshots as files have changed. And then that can be minute by minute. But then as time goes along, it spaces that out. So I can see minute by minute changes for the first 24 hours. Then it goes to you know hour by hour. But then if I look at something from a year ago, it might only have something from within a period of a month. So that system does that. Uh, that said, um, I have been told by a few people that the time machine, while it's easy to use, um, has its issues. Yeah. Not that I've ever had an issue with it, but it does have its issues. Um, and the other thing that I was looking at, and I did trial out, but I was having issues getting it onto my NAS, there was a product called EaseUs um, Backup. So it was an application you installed, and it would create automatic backups for you as well. There's one thing about backups, though, that's really important, and people don't think about this, and, and I know that we may, you know, there's places that people work may not do it, but if if you've rated this information as critical and that you must be able to get access back to it if something goes wrong, what you should also do is that you need to set up a six-monthly or a 12-monthly process where you actually test your backup process yep. and not the creation of the backup, the restoration from backup. Cause you could be backing up everything every day, but then something does go wrong three years after you set the process up and you go to restore it and it doesn't work. Yep. So good practice is firstly, you need to set up a process of not only backing up, but plan how you can recover from that backup. Yep. So the, some of the backup bits of software that I've used in the past and, and I know we're not kind of there yet. Mm. Um, uh, backup exec, um, the Acronis, I think it is. Yep. Um, where you can actually, well, I'll ask the question a different way. If all we're doing, sounds like anyway, and, and I don't want people to get the wrong impression, that all we're doing is kind of continually backing up what's changed. So how do we recover that? At some point, there must be a full backup that we can kind of start, start yeah. at. And, and I think you, you've hit the nail on the head there, Shane, that you've, you've got us there. Like, you know, I said I use Google Drive and, and there's Dropbox and things like that. Technically, they are not a backup solution. Um, and the reason f they can be utilized as a backup solution, but they are technically not a backup solution because you change a file and it saves into your Dropbox folder, it will automatically update that change to the cloud. And the same goes with OneDrive, Google Drive, and things like that. And so, therefore, you're not backing the information up. You're just copying it to a location that's outside of your network. Mm -hmm. So, if you go, well, that file has been hacked. Say, for example, you get a malicious file on your system and it saves over the top of an existing file. That file automatically gets backed up as well or it was sent to the cloud. Yep. So, what you then need to do is, you, as you said, Shane, snapshots. So one way, you know, not 100% not foolproof, but one way is to say, well, what you can do is you can create a snapshot of your system, whether it be your entire system, whether it be a, your documents um, drive or the things like that, and you can back, you can have that snapshot backed up to the cloud. So the thing is you might have a folder that has, you know, 20 snapshots in it. So there's point in time snapshot. So that, that's sort of a mid-range point of getting there so you can still use your cloud service but you've also got to look at well how big is the snapshot mm. and can your network handle it and all that sort of stuff yep and oh what was the question i was going to ask in relation to that snapshots no i think it might be gone oh no um so with the snapshots i guess it depends on the product and all mm. that kind of stuff are they um, are they encrypted, or can someone just take a snapshot and then work it on an equivalent NAS and Bobby's your uncle? It's it's well, it depends. It's up to you. So it's up to how you've set up your encryption, set up your backup. So you can have an encrypted backup. You can have um, 
you can have a non-encrypted backup, but you need to look at what information is stored in that backup. So um, while not 100% perfect, the one that that um, is quite good uh, at a level that people sort of get is the, um, is the iPhone process. So uh, unlike most other people, I still back up my iPhone occasionally to my computer yep. instead of... Um, the, the cloud all the time and the reason for that is that I'm a tight ass and don't want to pay the extra photo storage um, um, because otherwise it would blow out my cloud storage totally but the thing is is that you uh, when I back it up to the computer it does an encrypted backup um, and the encrypted backup for example stores all the passwords that I use for different services whereas if I did an unencrypted version and this is the way Apple treat it as opposed to this is what happens with every backup, yeah. that if I restored an unencrypted backup, it would put all the apps and the photos and stuff, but any of my accounts like Twitter or iCloud or whatever, all of the passwords would not be included. I thought it was smart enough to know that. Yes. So the iPhone determines whether I should save the passwords and things like that. That's in that occasion. That doesn't mean that the backup software you put on your Windows machine does that as well. Yep. So the, the, the great thing is, the, what I would suggest to people is create a, um, when you, particularly if you've just set, set up a machine and you've got some stuff on there, take a backup of, take an image of that hard drive then because then if you have a failure, you can just restore that and it will have your settings. It will have any software that you had a great example, and this is this is not really a backup, but one that made it easier, was at the radio station I had to transition. Uh, the, we run out of hard drive space on an SSD on one of our NUCs. So what I did was, was I um, made a backup. I got the new SSD, swapped it out on the machine, and then when you ran the setup, it restored from backup, but expanded out onto the bigger volume. Um, bang. And I, it was up and running again in half an hour. All right. It was fantastic. Couldn't couldn't recommend it anymore. So um, uh, yeah. So there's plenty there's plenty of um, of options that are around there for you. Um, we'll include in the show notes some proprietary and open source backup solutions and what they can do. Because you know the the one thing that you want to look at is well, okay, are you a mixed OS environment? Do you use Windows? Do you use Mac? Do you use only Mac? So you want to make sure that there's versions for Windows, Mac, even Linux. Um, how, how, what's your technical expertise on doing these backups? How do you want to access them? Whether you have access on the command line and things like that. So you, you need to look at those things um, and see what they're based a, a, up on. Um, and there's a heap of different proprietary versions and free versions out there that you can use. So there's some great options from a software perspective. And then you've got to decide once, once you've got the backup software in or well, when, what do you do with it? So do you save it to a hard drive? Do you save it to a NAS and then to the cloud? Do you just save it to a NAS? So as I said at the start of the, the, um, the segment that you should look at your, um, what your critical information assets are, your crown jewels, and then, determine how important they are and how much value do you place on them and then have services based there accordingly. Yep. So if it's completely imperative to your business that you have a backup of all this data, then you don't go, well, I can just use a free service. No, pay for something that's scalable and gives you the type of things that you need. Did we want to um, rattle sorry, off? Go on. I was going to say, did we want to rattle off? You know, maybe the top ten on the on the link that's in the show notes, or are you just going to let people? Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We do that. So, um, I'm just having a look. They're all in. Um, no, I think I'm looking at the different ones. So we'll go to. I think it should be a Wikipedia thing. Yeah, no, no. I mean that, and it's not done by a ranking. It's just done by. Um, alphabetical order. Oh, okay. So there, there's a few in there, the proprietary, such as um, a backup, but back, but instead of an A, it's a V. So B V C K U P um, is one I've heard of. Backup exec from Veritas Software. 
um, that sort of covers, you know, Linux, iOS, sorry, OS, Windows. But then let's have a look and see how much that is. It's expensive. There you go. But then it does server stuff as well. So it, it's a um, oh, current offers. What are the current offers that it has? Oh, there's something really loud in the background. It doesn't tell you how much. It just says 35% off retail. But, yeah, you, you need to decide and you need to look at your environment um, to determine, well, what is the most best, best solution. There's no point but getting an enterprise backup solution that covers servers and, you know, all that sort of stuff if you run two PCs at home. Yeah. So look at a family plan for another service and things like that. So there's a heap of different ones around. Um you know, for example, Komodo, I think Komodo backup I saw is a Windows-based one. Um, HP Data Protector seems to have something for everyone. This is the... Yeah, the specific ones, like, and then you got Crash Plan, which is just um, Mac, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there's a few that are just particularly Mac. Um, and it also, some of the things, you know, work for different things. Like, for example, Time Machine, which is a local backup thing that Microsoft, uh, that Apple do is only available for Mac. Yep. So, um, and then your servers, you, you're actually, if you're running servers and things like that, they usually have backup tools as well. So anyway, we'll put a link into the show notes. There's this great page on um, Wikipedia that has the different, different um, main brands of software and whether it's open source or proprietary and then what platforms it's supported by, because that, that's the best way to look at it and what you need to do. Yep. So once you've then decided your backup plan and then how you're going to store it, are you going to do hard drives and you're going to take, a, then you might decide, well, if I'm going to do the hard drives, you might want to buy four or five of them, which is probably your cheapest option these days. Uh, external hard drives, you back up to a hard drive and then you store that um, hard drive off-site in a in a third party location. So if you do have an issue with your building, you've got at least last night's backup and on a couple of days earlier in a different location. Yep. Um but then of course someone's actually physically got to take the hard drive home every day. Yeah. And you've got to remember to do it, you've got to do this, they've got to do that. So then the next option is we'll say, well, can we get it out? Can we get it into the cloud and do something like that? So we've talked about, about Dropbox and, and what have you, and they can be used as a backup solution, but you've got to understand how they work. You've got to understand what type of backups you're trying to do and then how you're going to get it on there. Yep. Um, but then you can also buy cloud services. So um, you might want to buy something like, um, you buy some web space off AWS, for example, Amazon Web Services. So the pricing does vary. Uh, if we go to, uh, say, Sydney, for example, so you can buy space. So Amazon do it things differently, where they, um, where you scale up your storage. So you don't pay for a hundred dollars for twenty gigabytes. You pay for the per um, gigabyte charge. Yep. So, for example, um, for the first fifty terabytes that you purchase. Uh, you pay Google 25 US cents, sorry, 2.5 US cents. Uh, Google just went off. 2.5 US cents for each gigabyte that you have. So if you have one gigabyte, you pay two cents per month. If you have 100, then you pay, you know, X amount of dollars. Um, and then... Then there's some transfer fees as well. So you need, you need to look at if you're transferring data regularly, well, then how does that work? So um, just seeing what there is there. No. There was, you only get a certain amount of storage. You get storage, but then you've got to actually, if you access that data regularly, then you've got to pay transfer fees on that as well because it's using their internet connection. Um so there's Amazon uh, Web Services, there is uh, Google Cloud, um, Google Cloud, um, you get five uh, gigabyte for free, but then what you can do is you can buy extra storage there. So if we go to Asia, there you're paying a 
zero two, so two point six cents um, for a gigabyte per storage per month in US dollars. Um, so then you can scale that up too. Um, and then Google does have certain f- transfer fees and things like that as well, bucket to bucket fees and what have you. The great thing about Google and I, Amazon do it as well. Um, but they have, if you need to transfer a heap of information to start your account off there, you can get what uh, I think they call in Amazon, they call the Snowball, yep. um, which is a it's like a hard drive storage device in a plastic case, plastic shock case, uh, secure system. So you can transfer your data in that locally, then get that sent to Amazon and then that, wow. Um, they will then transfer that. Sorry, I just had really loud noise come through my headphones. Um, they will then transfer that onto their cloud services for you. So yep. it's that one-off start. You can do it regularly too, but you need to look at what options are available there. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, well, what cloud services do you have built in with your existing plans? So, for example, you get 5 gig for free from Apple. And then you can update the price. Then, then you can buy additional pricing uh, from them for storage, which most of it's probably held on Amazon or Google services anyway. Yep. But the Australian pricing in Australian dollars, you get uh, 50 gigabytes for $1.49 a month. So which is not too bad, 15 yep. bucks a year. Yep. Um, but then it scales up. But you, you've got to buy it in blocks from them. You don't get per gigabyte. So... You you know you guaranteed a certain price, but you don't get the scalability. Yeah, that. yeah. Um. So yeah. So there's some of the cloud services. There's a few others. Obviously, Dropbox have pricing, but Dropbox are a different sort of beast because it's they have other vested interests as well, and you can use them as a collaboration tool. Um. So you know you pay if you're paying for a plan for Dropbox, it may not be the right. Um, platform for backups because you're paying for a lot of data storage but then you're not utilizing the ex- ex- extra features that they've got yep. um, and then of course OneDrive uh, through Microsoft Office 365 you can have a storage while well, you do get one terabyte of storage I think if you're on a paid plan um, you can have additional uh, storage so um, I'm just having a look at what you get so you can get an additional terabyte per user um, uh, for seven dollars a month, so that that's not great. You're probably better off bundling it because you can get an, a business premium account that gives you access to the software for seventeen dollars forty nine a month, and you get um, the one terabyte cloud access. Any, uh, yeah, one terabyte cloud hostage. Anyway, I'm just checking that to make a hundred percent sure which I'm pretty sure you do. So, yeah, so there's different options and they've all got backup systems on the computers and things like that. Um, but, yeah, business practices, whether it, when, and I say business practices, it is you need to have a backup culture. Yeah. So, and, and, and how, you know, automate it as much as you can, but understand what backups you need to do and where you're going to put them, whether it be off-site, on-site, things like that and think to yourself if everything if the house burnt down while you're at work and you lost everything what data is most important to get back yeah and then scale your backups and storage appropriately because the great thing is in windows mac whatever you can say well yeah i want to back up that whole hard drive but i want to pay extra attention to um, certain folders so that they do more regular backups or, you know, different transfer types and things like that. Yep. yep. So is there anything else that you wanted to add, ask or add in at this point, Shane? The only other ones that I wanted to kind of give a special mention to because um, they get used by different people at different times within, Absolutely. say, the, um, the, the Aussie Tech Heads kind of world. Yep. Um, I mean, and I, I started on iDrive. Yep. Um, then I dropped off, and I I'll cover this on the um, the NAS episode. But I dropped off that because they didn't actually have at the time a an app for iDrive. They only had Google Drive and a couple of other ones. Yep. Um, another one that Leo always uses, um, 
and I think it's a sponsor of his, is uh, Carbonite. Yep. Um, so they're the ones that, um, you know, they're probably the more, they're the ones that probably people are going to be more familiar with, um, especially if they kind of you know, pay attention to the, the podcast world like we do. Yep. So um, Carbonite you mentioned, um, and look, there's a heap of different, there's a heap of different ones around, and, you know, we'll put some links that, um, I think it was TechCrunch, was it? Um, uh, um, um, where was it? There was a link that, that we've got in the show notes that talked about specifically, um, well, this is the Wikipedia article, but there's a few articles out there that talk about the pros and cons of individual software. I would read through those, and most of them you can get, even if you're doing local storage backups, you can get a copy for a demo if it's a proprietary one. And then try that out. Yep. yep. And remember, don't forget your passwords if you include them. The other thing is that was an issue for me for a while, but it's not anymore, is um, your data limits with your ISP. Yes. Um, because especially when you first go to a new service and you, you know, you got to put all your data up there in one hit kind of thing. Um, you know, you, I was blowing my, my cap. Absolutely, and then and while this is more for a larger business, but the the snowballs and things like that that they have to do that. Um, but um, look, you're hundred percent spot on, Shane. Um, they uh, you need to look at your data limits and whether your the type of like we've got a pro- proliferation of ho- uh, unlimited plans available now in the market, but there are some that aren't, and how is that going to impact? Um, your plan and your general enjoyment of the internet. Yep, and some are labelled uh, unlimited, and depending on your definition, they are. But, you know, they get kind of slowed down, so you know, yeah, you could spend like weeks kind of doing your initial backup. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. I I wasn't even doing off-site backups of any kind, other than Dropbox when I for a long time. Um, but now that I use, now that I have the MBN and I have a fast swap load speed, I do that. I do it regularly. So I can just, it downloads the file automatically or uploads whatever I need to upload and it's yep. done. Yep. Plus our provider, Aussie Broadband, actually have true unlimited plans. Yes, they do. They do, which is good. And a lot of them do have true unlimited plans in the home space. It's your mobile space that's always the concern. Yep. I um, I have just updated my mobile plan Um only on Thursday and um, they've gone, oh, you've got an unlimited plan. You're on 40, you know, foot, but it's 40 gig a peak. Sorry. 40 gig a month, but then you have, um, but then we'll slow you down after that. So it's not unlimited. It's just 40 gig a month. Yeah. You get unlimited calls and texts. That's fair enough. But yeah, they, they always, um, load those and the A triple C are onto them as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's been so, in the media a lot lately. Yeah. And look, have an internet connection that's a, if you if you're gonna do online backups as well, have an internet connection that supports it. So if you're a business, look at getting fiber. It's gonna help you a lot. Yep. So yeah. Absolutely. All right. Was there if there anything else we want to do now I'm sure we've got a very brief overview of this. Um, and there are heaps of different options on there. But, you know, as we said, just to recap, assess your data. How important is it to you or the business that you're in? Um, look at the different options that are available, whether it be on-site, off-site, cloud. Cloud's sort of winning out over these days, but still you need to assess the different options. Yep. Um, and then look at how you're going to get the data there and whether your connection or your staff, if it's an off-site backup, can handle that, that, that process. And then finally, if you need to recover from backups, you need to test that you can recover from them. Yeah. Because if a backup's useless, if you can't recover from it, if you need to. So you should be doing simulations at least once a year where you recover data. Yep, yep. The only other thing that we didn't touch on, and you've mm-hmm. got to be a huge mungus kind of enterprise to probably be able to do this, but is um, uh, DR, Center Data, Re- data Recovery, um, or Disaster Recovery, um, dedicated kind of, center yeah and and it, look it might be it might be important for the type of business you are 
um, that you know you have that sort of facility available that you can walk into, switch the flick of the switch on, and off you go. Mm. Um, public transport in Victoria have them, um, and you'll find a lot of emergency or or critical services will have them. Yep. You just need to assess what works for you and and what your budget stretches to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So yes, but uh, yeah, they're all there's there's so often. I mean, God. That would be the perfect backup, Shane. I'll buy two blocks of land with two houses, identical, and then I furnish everything twice. That's a, <laughs> that's, that's a, what is a raid one approach to housing. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get sick. So, yes. Um, anyway. Yeah. So, go on. No, no. I was going to say, yeah, that's, that's another thing you're going to have to kind of test regularly, do the failover and see everything kind of switches across to the data, center, or the data recovery center. And then switch it back and see if it kind of comes back by itself. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it, it's, um, yeah, you need to test those things. Yeah. Testing is the key. Yep. So. All right. Well, I think we've covered off uh, on our discussion on backups for the, for this week. Yep. If you've got any uh, questions about it or if there's something that you would like to suggest that we may not have covered, send us an email, mytechopinion at prosumeit.com. Yep. Yep. Excellent. We're going to take a very quick break and then we'll come back to wrap it up straight after this on My Tech Opinion. And welcome back to My Tech Opinion. It is now time for us to finish up the show. We talked about backups tonight. We had a bit of a fleeting look. The the, the topic of backups could go on for hours and hours and hours. Um, but your the situations, your individual situation changes depending on your business or your home needs and things like that. So you've always got to do research, but, you know, look at cloud, which is always going to be your best bet if you've got fast broadband. But if it's critical, you might look at other physical versions as well, whether it be taking stuff off site or a combination of everything. Yeah. It's all the way to do it. Yep. Um, we are going to be doing episode 27 should be published soon, but the interesting thing is it's going to be a bit of a different episode, Shane. It is. Why is that? Because I'm coming over. Yeah, so we'll actually be in the same room. Yeah, I'll get to see whether you actually look like you look like on the video or there's not there's not any kind of trickery going on. Oh, there's no trickery. There is at my end. I'm really ugly in, in real life. <laughs> the funny thing is we could actually be sitting in the same room right now, but we're just separated by some overlay in the background. Yeah. There was some weird thing you were doing with the video before and it actually looked like that too. <laughs> so if I go that way, no, wrong way. Go that way. Yeah, right. my hand cuts off. But you had some, with the green screen, you had an overlay and then you reached over and your hand came over onto my side <laughs> of the screen and it was bizarre. <laughs> anyway, yeah. for those who are listening on the podcast, they've got no idea what I'm talking about. No, but you we, haven't, we haven't decided on episode 27 yet. We are going to let it uh, be a bit fluid um, and we'll talk about that um, when we get there. We've got a couple of options up our sleeve. Yep even though I always wear short sleeves, <laughs> something up there anyway. Um, but before we finish up, just to thank, thanks to uh, Aussie Tech Heads Web Hosting. Um, and uh, you can visit them at athwebhosting.com.au. They've got some great hosting plans and you can get support and you can do all those sort of things uh, from them. Um, and yeah, good Aussie company. They are. Who we've had Glenn on the show and everything, so which is great. Yeah, and that episode so, should be up soon, shouldn't it? Yes, since you brought it up. <laughs> yes. But the thing is, if you're watching, okay, we're going to change, we'll cut because the thing is, yeah, the, this episode won't go yeah, up before. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, this one will go up after it anyway. Yeah. That's so, right. We'll leave okay. a mistake in there. We're human. Okay. Anyway, LZ Tickets web hosting is the place to go. So um, we, do, we we film these episodes out of order. So that's it's just the way it is. Um, so that's it. Um, oh, yeah. Email us, mytechopinion at prosumeit.com. Also, leave us a review on the uh, iTunes podcast, uh, Apple podcast platform, and also the Google podcast platform. YouTube. And YouTube. And um, you can send us um, 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 letters full of money, if you like, because yep. that would be appreciated. Uh, anything preferably above two thousand dollars, so then that could get me return flight somewhere. So um, that would be great. There you yep, go. Absolutely, Aussie broadband. 
You should probably kick something in. We mentioned them that many times. Yeah, I know. I know. We might get that happening at some point. Anyway, so that's it for this episode. Um, We look forward to uh, uh, talking to you again. And make sure if you've got any suggestions for what we should talk about, send them in as well. Looking forward to it. That's it. I'm Phil. And, of course, Shane is sitting uh, on the other side of the room from me, even though he's not. (laughs) So we'll say goodbye. Bye, Bye, everyone. See See you next week.